Uh, good morning, and welcome to our release of full year and fourth quarter 2022 performance results for FDIC insured institutions. The banking industry reported continued positive results amid persistent economic uncertainty. Net interest income grew, loan growth continued, and asset quality measures remained favorable despite modest deterioration. The banking industry reported full year 2022 net income lower than full year 2021 net income, but still above the pre-pandemic average. The year-over-year -year decline was primarily due to higher provision expenses. That's the amount set aside by institutions to protect against future credit losses. Looking at quarterly results, fourth quarter net income decreased from the prior quarter as lower non-interest income and increased provisions offset gains in net interest income. Still, like the full year net income levels, fourth quarter industry net income was higher than the pre-pandemic average. Community banks annual net income in 2022 declined 0.3% from 2021. Net income increased quarter over quarter as higher net interest income and securities gains offset higher non-interest expense and provision expense. Rising short-term interest rates and continued loan growth supported a quarter over quarter increase in the net interest margin for the industry as a whole and for community banks. The change in deposit rates paid by banks continued to lag the change in rates charged on loans. The deposit insurance fund balance was $128.2 billion on December 31st. That was up $2.8 billion from the end of the third quarter. The reserve ratio increased by one basis point to 1.27% as insured deposits increased 1.4%. The banking industry continues to face significant downside risks from the effects of inflation, rising market interest rates, and continued geopolitical uncertainty. Credit quality and profitability may weaken due to these risks and may result in tighter loan underwriting, slower loan growth, higher provision expenses, and liquidity constraints. Additional short-term interest rate increases combined with longer asset maturities may also affect bank balance sheets in coming quarters. Unrealized losses, unavailable for sale and held to maturity securities, remained elevated at $620 billion. Higher market interest rates may also erode real estate and other asset values, as well as weaken borrowers' loan repayment ability. These will be matters of ongoing supervisory attention by the FDIC. Now getting into the details of these developments, our first chart shows that full year 2022 net income was $263 billion. This was a decline of 16.1 billion or 5.8% from the historically high levels reported in 2021, but was still greater than earnings prior to the pandemic. The decline was primarily attributable to an increase in provision expense of $82.6 billion in 2022 relative to 2021. Provision expenses increased the amount set aside by institutions to protect against future credit losses and reflect continued loan growth and economic uncertainty that may affect future credit quality. The return on assets ratio for the industry declined from 1.23% in 2021 to 1.2% 1 in 2022. Community banks reported annual net income of $30.4 billion in 2022. That's down 0.3% from 2021. A substantial increase in net interest income was offset by decreased non-interest income and increased non-interest and in provision expenses. As shown in this next chart, the banking industry reported net income of $68.4 billion in the fourth quarter of 2022. That was down $3.3 billion or 4.6% 4 
from the prior quarter. Strong growth in interest income pushed net interest income up 6.7%. Nevertheless, the growth in net interest income was more than offset by a, de de by a decrease in non-interest income and an increase in provision expense. Community banks reported a modest increase in net income from the last quarter. Our next chart shows a quarterly net operating revenue decreased down about a percent from third quarter 22 to 242.9 billion. But net interest income as a percentage of average assets increased from the third quarter and now exceeds the pre-pandemic average. Non-interest income declined when compared to the third quarter, caused in part by lower trading revenue. This next chart shows the net interest margin for the five asset size groups in which the, on which the QBP reports. The net interest margin for the banking industry as a whole widened for the third consecutive quarter, increasing 23 basis points from the last quarter to 3.37% and is now above the pre-pandemic average of 3.25%. Despite the improvement, the net interest margin improved at a slower pace than the prior quarter as deposit costs in increased. The net interest margin for community banks also expanded, but by a smaller amount than the industry. The net interest margin at community banks widened seven basis points from the third quarter to 3.71%. This next chart shows the quarter over quarter changes in the industry's yield on loans and cost of deposits, which helped to explain the industry's increasing net interest margin over the past three quarters. Both loan yields that's the interest bank's charge on loans, and deposit costs, that's the interest that banks pay on deposits, began to increase in the second quarter of 2022 when market interest rates began to increase rapidly. Loan yields increased significantly more than deposit costs in each of the last three quarters. In the fourth quarter, the banking industry reported that yields on loans increased by 73 basis points, while the cost of deposits increased by 46 basis points. Competitive pressures to raise interest rates on deposits may bring about some greater balance in future quarters. Historical experience suggests that the gap between changes in loan yields and deposit costs tends to increase early in rate rising cycles but then decreases when market rates stabilize or decline. Now, this next chart shows that the banking industry's holdings of longer-term loans and securities increased by 39.7% in the fourth quarter. Although this higher level of long-term loans and securities helped preserve net interest margins during a period of low interest rates, this strategy has contributed to the elevated level of unrealized losses on investment securities as a result of higher interest rates. Compared with the industry, community banks continue to report a higher proportion of assets with maturities longer than three years at 54.7% of total assets. Now related to this, this next chart shows the elevated level of unrealized losses on investment securities due to high market interest rates. Unrealized losses on available for sale and held to maturity securities totaled $620 billion in the fourth quarter, down $69.5 billion from the prior quarter, due in part to lower mortgage rates. The combination of a high level of longer-term asset maturities and a moderate decline in total deposits underscores the risk that these unrealized losses could become actual losses should banks need to sell securities to meet liquidity needs. Now, this next chart shows that 
total loan balances grew for a seventh consecutive quarter. Loan growth for the industry continued to exceed the pre-pandemic pace in the fourth quarter. The banking industry reported annu annual growth of 8.7% from the previous year, well above the pre-pandemic average. That growth was led by higher commercial and industrial loans, one to four family residential mortgages, and consumer loans. Compared to the industry, community banks reported stronger loan growth, increasing 14.4% year over year. Non-farm, non-residential commercial real estate loan portfolios and one to four family residential mortgages drove annual loan growth for community banks. The Paycheck Protection Program loan payoffs and forgiveness continue to affect loan growth rates. Excluding the effects of these PPP loan payoffs, the year-over-year -year loan growth rate would have been 9.6% for the industry and 16.2% for community banks. Loan growth has been robust during the last year, driven by pent-up demand from both consumers and businesses, as well as higher inflation. With such robust loan growth, underwriting standards will remain an area of supervisory attention given the persistent economic uncertainty. Our next chart shows that asset quality ratios for the industry remain favorable. The non-current and net charge-off rates increased modestly but remained below pre-pandemic averages. The non-current rate increased one basis point from third quarter to 0.73%, driven by increases in non-current credit card loan balances, increases in consumer loan net charge-offs, specifically credit card and auto net charge-offs, drove a 10 basis point increase in the industry's net charge-off rates from a quarter ago to 0.36%. Early de delinquencies, those that are loans that are past due 30 to 89 days, increased slightly from the prior quarter, driven by past due one to four, one, one to four family residential, auto, and credit card loans. Despite the increases in non-current and delinquent loans, credit quality metrics remain better than pre-pandemic averages. Nonetheless, the trends could be an indicator of future asset quality problems and will be an area of continued supervisory monitoring. Community banks reported stable credit quality metrics. The community bank non-current rate declined two basis points from the previous quarter to 0.44%. That's the lowest level on QBP record. The community bank net charge-off rate increased four basis points from a quarter ago to 0.11%. Like the industry, early delinquencies for community banks increased from the prior quarter, driven by an increase in past due one to four family residential, non-farm, non non-residential CRE, and consumer loan balances. Also like the industry, community bank credit quality metrics remain better than pre-pandemic averages. Our next chart shows that the allowance for credit losses grew more than non-current loan balances, resulting in an increase in the reserve coverage ratio. The ratio of credit loss reserves to non-current loans increased from 178.7% a year ago to 217.6%, Again, that's the highest level on QBP record. This next chart shows that the number shows the number and total assets of banks on the problem bank list. The number of banks on the list decreased by three from the previous quarter to 39 banks, and total assets held by problem problem banks declined by 116.3 billion to 47.5 billion in the fourth quarter. 
The number of problem banks is at the lowest level since QBP data collection began in 1984. No failures occurred in the fourth quarter. And there has now not been a bank failure in 28 months. That is actually three months short of the record of 31 months set in 2007. This next chart shows that deposits declined for a third consecutive quarter. Total deposits were 19.2 trillion. That's down 0.7% from the level reported in the third quarter. While this reduction slightly offsets the unprecedented growth in deposits reported during the pandemic, total deposits are still well above pre-pandemic average levels. A reduction in uninsured deposits was the driver of the quarterly decline since insured deposits increased. This next chart shows that the deposit insurance fund balance was $128.2 billion on December 31. That's up approximately $2.8 billion from the third quarter. Assessment revenue was the primary driver of the increase in the fund. Interest on investments and a net decrease in unreal, unrealized losses unavailable for sales securities in the deposit insurance fund portfolio also contributed to the growth this quarter. Insured deposits increased by 1.4% during the fourth quarter. Year over year, insured deposit growth was 3.3%. The reserve ratio, that's the fund balance relative to insured deposits, increased by one basis point in the fourth quarter to 1.27% as of December 31. The reserve ratio was also one basis point higher than a year ago. The FDIC adopted a deposit insurance fund restoration plan on September 15, 2020, intended to return the reserve ratio to 1.35%, that's the statutory minimum, by September 2028 as required by law. In October 2022, the FDIC board finalized a rule to an increase initial base deposit insurance assessment rate schedules by two basis points beginning in the first quarter of 2023. These actions were undertaken to improve the likelihood that the reserve ratio reaches the statutory minimum of 1.35% before the statutory deadline of September 2028 while reducing the potential for a pro-cyclical increase in assessment rates should the banking industry enter a period of stress in the interim. So, in conclusion, overall, key banking industry metrics remain favorable at this time. Loan growth continued, net interest income grew, and asset quality measures remain favorable. Further, the industry remains well capitalized and highly liquid. However, the banking industry continues to face downside risk, risks from the effects of inflation, rising market interest rates, and continued geopolitical uncertainty. These could hurt bank profitability, weaken credit quality and capital, and limit loan and deposit growth. And these risks will be matters of continued supervisory attention by the FDIC over the coming year. That concludes my statements for today. Thank you for your attention, and I'd be glad to take your questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, if you'd like to ask a question, please use the raise your hand feature and I'll call on you by name. The first question is from Abrima Sane from American Banker. Go ahead. Hi, Abrima Sane from American Banker. Um, Chairman, I'm curious what criteria land the bank on the problem bank list. Uh, does presence on the list solely reflect weaknesses on the bank's balance sheet, or could qualitative supervisory issues put a bank on that list as well? Raymond, thank you for the question. It's pretty straightforward. You know, we have a CAMELS rating system um, for our supervised institutions from one to five, one being the highest, five being the lowest. 
and for a bank to be placed on the problem bank list, it would have to be rated a four or five, the lowest ratings on the, on the CAMEL scale. Our next question is from Victoria Guida at Politico. Go ahead, Victoria. Hey, um, I have a I have a non QBP question, if that's all right. Um, I, I wanted to ask about um, the Community Reinvestment Act proposal. Um, Chair Greenberg, I think you said last year that it would be finalized sometime early this year. I was wondering um, how soon you all expect to finish that, um, you know, and, and and whether you expect there to be significant changes given um, the level of pushback that you've seen from the banking industry. Thanks for the question, Victoria. I think it's fair to say it's a top priority for all three of the banking agencies responsible for the rulemaking, the, the Fed and the uh, OCC and the FDIC. Uh, we're working hard on it. I think we are hopeful to finalize the rule in the, in the first half of this year. And we did receive uh, a lot of comments. I think there were a thousand individual uh, comments or more that we've received and we're carefully reviewing them and we'll give them uh, serious consideration as, as we work on, on finalizing uh, the proposed rule. Our next question is from Evan Weinberger at Bloomberg Law. Go ahead, Evan. Hi, thanks so much. And staying with the question about CRA, do you think that the departure of Governor, uh, Vice Chair Brainerd from the Fed Board of Governors is gonna impact the work at all? I don't think so. Let me say that um, former Governor Brainerd uh, really provided exceptional leadership uh, in moving forward uh, this major revision to the Community Reinvestment Act, uh, and she really deserves a lot of credit for that. Uh, that being said, I think the, the three banking agencies are working to, together very cooperatively and collaboratively, and you know I think we'll be able to, to move forward and, and finalize the rule in a timely way. Seeing no hands. Do a last call for any questions. Evan, your hands up. Do you have another question? I do. I figure if nobody else is going to ask questions, I got a couple more. Um, first, uh, you know, the, the Biden administration and the CFPB have been making a big push on junk fees. Uh, a lot of that is directed at banks. Are you concerned that this focus on fees could have any impact on bank earnings in the future? It's hard. It's hard to assess that. I think um, you know the focus there is on fees that lack transparency, that uh, consumers don't have full understanding in regard to. I don't quite know how to assess that. How you know that might impact on the on the matter that you raised, though. Thanks. Uh, I guess if nobody else has anything else, I'll I'll just do one more, which is, um, are you know, the the inspector general's report, um, recent inspector general's report raised concerns about the potential effect of the current CFPB litigation at the Supreme Court on the FDIC. I just wanted to see if you have any concerns about what it means for federal independent federal regulators or uh, the FDIC's operations, or even you know, the makeup of the board if, if uh, the CFPB is declared unconstitutional? No, I, look, I, I understand why you asked the question, but as you indicated, this is, is a matter uh, in litigation at the highest level, so I'm really not in a position to comment on it. Thanks. Any other questions? Oh, we have uh, Katanga Johnson at Bloomberg. 
Go ahead, Katanga. Hi there. Thanks again for, for making time for us today. I just had a question about, I know there have been a lot of joint statements around crypto guidance coming up from the main banking regulators, but I was just curious about, from the FDIC's perspective, just how you view what um, has been has been said is, is like this readying of some sort of uh, crypto guidance between the three agencies. What's your take on where that stands? What's the rub? Any, any updates you can provide? Well, I think the agencies have been working collaboratively uh, in regard to providing guard, guidance um, uh, for bank engagement with crypto asset related activities. You know, the, the, um, all three agencies initially have been taking a case by case approach. The FDIC issued a financial institution letter uh, last year in which we asked all the banks we supervise uh, that may be engaging in crypto asset activity or thinking about it uh, to let us know. And if they are engaging in it, give us, uh, give us some detail on what they're doing so we could evaluate it and provide supervisory feedback. I think the other banking agencies are, have been taking similar approaches, you know, and we indicated that as we gain more experience on this case-by-case -case review, we might issue broader guidance, and, and indeed that's what we did. As you know, in the early part of January, we issued, the three agencies issued a joint statement uh, providing sort of an overview of the risks uh, that could be presented uh, by, by uh, uh, to banks by crypto asset related activity and more recently we provided a joint statement specifically relating to liquidity risk in regard to um, crypto asset related activity and as we go along here we may as we gain additional experience um, uh, may uh, provide further guidance I think the agencies have been uh, working together on this to try to provide consistency know, across all of our uh, insured depository institutions. And then just, just one follow-up, if I may. Could, will, might we expect to continue to see this sort of iterative uh, statements from the agencies um, collectively, or, or is there any anticipation that the FDIC might, uh, might move forward with something independently? I think... Um, uh, in, in, in terms of uh, broader guidance, the agencies have, been, have generally been working together. Um, I'm, we're going to uh, circle back to Victoria. She had her hand up, and then we'll, we'll go to Allison. Go ahead, Victoria. Thanks. Yeah, um, just uh, just sort of a follow up on the on the crypto stuff. Um, your your agency, I think, said um, that there were 136 banks. Um, that had crypto plans. And I was just wondering if you could um, speak to, you know, any overall impressions from the types of things that those banks are thinking about doing. Um, you know, are, are they in large part problematic? Are they in large part, you know, something that you're willing to work with them on? Is, is, there, is there any sort of like broad conclusions that you can draw from what you've heard from banks so far? Well, Victoria, I think what you're referencing is a recently released report from our inspector general. Um, I, I can tell you that, uh, w which included banks uh, that were both engaging in crypto asset related activity and thinking about it. Uh, the feedback that we've gotten is that about uh, a couple of dozen of FDIC supervised institutions are, active, are actively engaging uh, in crypto asset related activity. It's a variety of kinds of activity. And we're in the process of uh, providing a specific supervisory uh, feedback to them and, and uh, you know it's a, it's it's a range of activity our next question is from Allison Bennett at s p global go ahead Allison thank you I know you're on. You're unmuted, but we can't hear you. Do you want to put your question in the chat? All 
Alternatively, you can email uh, media requests at FDA. Oh, here she is. Uh, Allison's question is, you mentioned in your comments that unrealized losses remain elevated. So that's the first part of the question. Allison, do you want to go ahead and email uh, email us your question? We can circle back with you after the press briefing and get you an answer. You can contact Julianne Brightbeal in our office or media requests at FDIC.gov. Sorry about that. Abrima from American Banker, we'll go to you. Hi, the Chairman. Um, so something I've been following is the rise of what I call pseudo banks who attract consumers with eye poppingly high interest rates um, with net interest income continuing to be elevated. Uh, could low interest rates being paid on consumer deposits drive more consumers to seek such risky investments at uh, alternatives? It's a, it's a good question. We, um, thus far, as I've indicated, uh, insured deposit, while, while um, uninsured deposits have been uh, uh, declining, insured deposits have continued to increase. So it looks like the um, you know, depositors um, that represent the large majority of retail deposits you know, are continuing to, uh, to rely on their insured institutions for their savings. Thank you. I want to try to circle back to Allison's question she puts in the chat. You mentioned in your comments that unrealized losses remain elevated. What's your sense of the situation? Can you explain a little more about the situation? In the prepared statement, you know, um, leading up to the past year when the Fed has moved to a of rising interest rate policy, there had been a prolonged period of very low interest rates. And uh, during that time, um, in order to deal with a low interest rate environment, a lot of our banks made longer term loans and invested in longer term securities in order to manage a low interest rate environment. But as rates have been rising, the value of those securities on the balance sheets of our banks decline. Now, those losses are unrealized until the banks decide to sell those securities, but they are a, accumulate, a substantial accumulation of unrealized losses uh, on, on the books of our banks. Right now, our banks are strongly capitalized, so there's not a short-term pressure um, to sell assets, but depending on how the economic environment evolves, if liquidity becomes tighter and uh, banks need to sell some of those assets to bring in funds, that could impose uh, losses on the institutions. And some of those institutions have significant concentrations, and it could be consequential for those institutions and for the industry as a whole, which is why we're, we're paying close attention to it and, and flagging it, you know, in the QVP. We have time for one more question. Uh, again, senior staff will remain on the call after the live stream to take any questions regarding today's data. Um, the last question will uh, will go to you, Evan. Hi. Um, so one thing I've noticed is that people in the crypto community, some in Congress and others have been comparing what's going on with crypto to Operation Choke Point and uh, saying that you know the banks are being told not to do business with crypto companies. I just wanted to see if you had any com any response to that, any comment on that. We've been we've tried to be very clear in the in the guidance that the agencies issued, the broader guidance in January and the more recent guidance on liquidity that uh, what we're outlining in the guidance is frankly the traditional risk management standards that we apply to our institutions. 
And we specifically say that it's not intended neither to prohibit nor discourage activity. All we're doing, frankly, is uh, highlighting the traditional risk management uh, standards uh, that have long been applied to our, our institutions as they engage with this activity, which, as we've indicated in the guidance, has shown uh, a lot of uh, volatility and risk. So we thought it prudent to lay out the basic risk management standards uh, broadly and then now specifically on liquidity. And it's an, it's, there's, these are our, our established standards. There's really nothing new here, just that they need to be thoughtfully applied uh, to this area of activity. All right, great. Thank you so much. Thank you. That concludes our live stream. Uh, we appreciate you joining today's today's briefing. Thank you all. Thanks to everybody. Thanks for joining us today.